what what was what was different? I mean, that's that's actually another question. Is, is the, well, the times were very different. Right. The, uh, patronage was the accepted mode of operation. Right. There, there was civil service, but it was a relatively so small number of people who were in civil service. Police and fire had to take exams to join the, the, the departments, but there were a lot of shenanigans there, and it was pretty much accepted. So that w what you had was more akin to a late Middle Ages fiefdom <laughs> than anything else. You know, you you had the lord of the manor and, you know, a, a bunch of courtiers uh, who, who had power. And then there were all of us peasants. Now, some of us were in the sort of landed peasantry, and then there was the rest of us. Right. <laughs> and, and that's the way things were. I mean, there were not... Unions existed, and the, the skilled trades guys belonged to their respective mm -hmm. unions, but they didn't have contracts. They had a handshake deal with the mayor to pay prevailing wage, mm -hmm. but they didn't negotiate contracts. There was simply an agreement that they would be paid prevailing wage so that you didn't have all of these layers of protection. And the other thing, of course, is you had uh, the regular democratic organization with strong ward organizations, some stronger than others, but you still had, except in a couple of wards, you know, 41 and 47 at the time, which trended Republican, you had these uh, fairly strong war mm -hmm. organizations, and you had their committeemen, who were the political representatives, and the aldermen, who were the elected, rep well, committeemen were elected as well, but only the faithful went to bother voting for a committeeman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so that you had this, this political infrastructure. That's gone today. There are very few strong war organizations left. Mm -hmm. uh, without patronage, you know, who cares who a committeeman is or what he does? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, they get they get to select judges, but so what? You know, right. if you're not in the legal community, you don't get real excited about that. Right. Uh, well, why don't we stop here? We have a series of questions uh, following up on your phase in the Model Cities program that we okay. didn't address before. But why don't we stop now? Uh, this is Gary Johnson. Today is June 2nd, 2009, and we are at the Chicago History Museum. This is uh, uh, our next uh, segment with Sharon Gist Gilliam. And I have a few follow-up questions regarding the Model Cities program that you worked on for the city of Chicago in um, your early days. Uh, first of all, would, would you say that eradicating poverty was a priority for Mayor Richard J. Daley? I don't know that it was a priority. Uh, certainly, he saw improving the neighborhoods as a priority, yes. Because in his mind, you know, if you had good housing stock and people who were working and kids who were going to school and all of that nice stuff. I mean, that is how the world ought to be. It ought to meet right. this, if not middle class standards, it's certainly an upper working class standard. So, right. uh, um, Some critics of the Model Cities program somewhat ironically say that its, its greatest legacy may have been to provide residents with the, the means to move to different and better neighborhoods uh, be, you know, through savviness or, or whatever. So uh, what's wrong with that? Do you, think it, do you think it was the case? 
Yeah. My husband often says to me, the poverty program and the model cities program provided you and your friends a way up. Mm -hmm. And to some degree, though that wasn't the intent, it was true. Those social programs of the 60s and early 70s made it possible for people who could take advantage of an opportunity because they had the education uh, and, and background and drive. They could take advantage of these new opportunities that were presented and move up the ladder, both in government and as they moved up, gained the skills to go into the private sector. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now, did that necessarily benefit the poor and the downtrodden? No, because we were basically middle class, college educated blacks who now had an opportunity to, to move ahead. Now, you, you mentioned um, there were four target communities right. for the Model Cities program in Chicago. And I remember you mentioned that, that one of the health clinics survives in one of these four areas. But, but in one, Uptown. In yeah. Uptown. So why don't we go back, you know, one, two, three, four, and if you could, you could tell us what, if any, lasting benefits there were in, in those communities. Okay. Let's start with Uptown because... Well, Uptown, you, well, you had the, uh, the Uptown Neighborhood Health Center, which it still exists. Right. But I suspect that uh, the efforts in Uptown to, to, to stabilize it and then slowly but surely turn it around led to what we've had over the last 10 years, which is the gentrification of mm -hmm. Uptown now. It depends on where you stand on gentrification, right. whether or not you see that as better. But uh, s certainly, so it was a factor. It, it was I, it was a factor because you know Uptown was, uh, you know, in dire shape. But much of much of what goes on, such as Uptown, is nothing more than the continual change in cities. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't remember any longer, but once upon a time, uh, this very community, where we are now, was on the ropes. Lincoln Park, parts of it were a slum, and it was it was questionable that it that it would survive. Lincoln Park, you know, where now if you can find a home for under three quarters of a million dollars, it is a near miracle. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's well, well, well I, just to add a personal anecdote on that, my wife and I um, uh, lived in a building that went condo, 716 West Webster, 1978. And uh, Mayor Byrne had a, a subsidized mortgage program for first-time home buyers. We applied, and we were denied our mortgage because we lived in Lincoln Park in an area across from the DePaul Settlement okay. House. And they said, "Oh, we, you know, this isn't the kind of neighborhood where we're going to give you a mortgage." <laughs> Think about that. So that's your point, right? But let's go go to those other okay. uh, neighborhoods. Uh, it was Englewood. Another no, one? no, we were not in Englewood, near South, near which South. today is called Bronzeville. Bronzeville. So uh, there, you know, we had a number of programs, and once again, you know, near South or what is now the Bronzeville area, you know, started to stabilize, and then it started to trend up, and it is still going through. Uh, right trending up, but you had, until this latest economic uh, collapse, I mean, you had condos being constructed, 
buildings being rehabbed. And the interesting thing about that community is you still had some very old housing stock, mm -hmm. uh, which had been during the war years, really, the Second World War years, been cut up into all kinds. You've had people going in, buying those, and restoring them to single family homes. Uh, and this is places where you've got, you know, oak woodwork and pocket right. doors and third floor ballrooms, all this kind of right. kind of thing. Uh, and and those houses are being restored. Third community. Uh, what was called Mid South. Mid South. Uh, and it's really the Woodlawn community. There was a Woodlawn Health Center, which I think has been taken over by some other group now, uh, and I'm not sure. Uh, there, Woodlawn was really a matter of sort of arresting deterioration. Mm -hmm. uh, it is starting to come back. Woodlawn lost a tremendous amount of population. I mean, people just moved out. Uh, it also probably had one of, and you'd have to check with the fire department, one of the highest rates of arson for a mm -hmm. while. I mean, you know, uh, building owners, you know, would just, just burn the places down, collect fire insurance, and go on their way. What, what period was, was that? That would have been the very early 70s. And so would you... Because I was at Model Cities from 69 to 73, 73. four years. And, and so would you say that the Model Cities program was a factor in the halting of deterioration yeah. there? Right. And then the right. fourth was on the west Lawndale. side, Lawndale. And Lawndale, I think probably we had the least impact. I mean, Lawndale still has not re returned to what it once was. But Lawndale was the only com uh, community that really suffered uh, physical, physically from the, the after King's assassination riots. Mm -hmm. I mean, so much of Lawndale just got burnt down. It right. was burned down. So you had a tremendous loss of population. Uh, the Roosevelt Road business community, for all intents and purposes, disappeared. Uh, you know, that was just, and it, it's had a very long time coming back. But, you know, it's 30 blocks from downtown Chicago. It will come back. Mm -hmm. It, you know. Now, it, it seems as if the three out of the four, you, you pointed to model cities as a factor. Mm -hmm. um, to generalize, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the dynamics seem to be stabilizing matters, which, which held for a period of years. And then there was a kind of delayed reaction where then after a period of time, sometimes a long period of time, there was an upswing. Right. Is that the way, that's the way you characterize that? That's kind of the way that? I'd see it, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we eventually model cities merged with CCUO, the old property program. And what you had was a merged organization, Model City CCU. Oh, and none of this stuff totally disappears. Model City CCUO became the city's DHR, Department of Human Resources, which became today's Department of Human Services. Mm -hmm. And you know, while the federal money isn't there any longer, some of the programs are, they've been folded in, into other federal programs, and there are still a few, very few people around in those agents, in that agency, that actually go back, mm -hmm. you know, 30, 40 years uh, to this time. 